Hello all. So far this channel's explored the meaning of some of the most famous nursery rhymes, and in so doing I've often referenced the books and people who first put the rhymes on paper. So I thought it'd be fun to do a short, irregular series of videos on some of these publications and people. The focus of today's video is the first person to systematically collect and collate English nursery rhymes, James Orchard Halliwell Phillips. And what a story it is. An antiquarian, a leading scholar of Shakespeare, and to add a bit of spice, a kleptomaniac and a biblioclam, thus a destroyer of books. And a man who was at the same time a member of the Royal Society and banned from the British Library. Oh yes, and he's also the author of the fable The Three Little Pigs. James Orchard Halliwell, the Phillips was added later, was born in 1820 in Sloane Street, Chelsea, to a well-to-do Lancastrian linen draper. He was a precocious talent. While still at school, he contributed biographies on mathematicians and scientists to the Parthenon magazine. He entered Cambridge University in 1837, first attending Trinity College, but soon transferring to Jesus College. This seemingly uneventful change of college would lead to a scandal a few years later, which we'll discuss, which embroiled the Prime Minister. At Cambridge he developed his interest in collecting manuscripts, which would remain a passion or even an obsession for the rest of his life. In 1839, still aged only 19, he was made a Fellow of the Society of Antiquarians and was elected the youngest ever Fellow of the Royal Society. He formed the Cambridge Antiquarian Society, the Historical Society of Science. He became one of the founders of both the Percy Society and the Shakespeare Society. These societies attracted some distinguished members, including the experimental scientist Michael Faraday, the astronomer Francis Bailey, and the antiquarian Sir Thomas Phillips, of whom more later. Financial difficulties meant that Halliwell never graduated from Cambridge University, but instead embarked on a career as a self-published scholar, antiquarian and bookseller. It's at this point that we get particularly interested in Halliwell. In 1842, still only aged 22, his interest switched, albeit briefly, to nursery rhymes. He published the first edition of his Nursery Rhymes of England, he claimed in the preface that he collected the rhymes principally from oral tradition, although it seems likely he had access to some of the earlier publications, which I've mentioned in other videos, and we can explore if you like, such as Gamma Gurdon's Garland and Songs for the Nursery. He also states the rhymes are drawn from almost every county of England, and in some cases Scotland. He says that they all predate the turn of the 19th century. This is an amazing achievement given his age and the difficulties of travel in mid-Victorian Britain. The layout of the book is perhaps not the best for those seeking to find a rhyme. Rather than listing them alphabetically by first name, which might seem obvious, Halliwell divided the rhymes by theme into 18 chapters. Secondly, his study for the most part simply reproduced the rhymes without comment on the origins or where he'd heard them. Only around 10%, such as three blind mice here, have additional notes or comments. That's not to belittle the achievement. He wasn't aiming to provide an exhaustive account on the origins of nursery rhymes, and we should be thankful of the hundreds of rhymes that are listed, many appearing for the first time, such as Goosey Goosey Gander, which I did a video about. Halliwell's collection proved popular, and it would eventually be reprinted half a dozen times over the next 50 years. For us today, perhaps the most significant aspect of the publication is it's the first time The Three Little Pigs appears in print. He seems to have discovered the fable sometime in the 1880s, as it's not present until the 1886 fifth edition. The story was taken up and published by Joseph Jacob in 1890, but he cites Halliwell as his source. Many of the phrases we associate with the story come from Halliwell, like little pig, little pig, let me come in, not by the hair on my chinny chin chin, then I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house in, all come from this version. But Halliwell's life had a lot more to it than simply creating a list of rhymes and writing about the civil engineering failures of pigs and the lung capacity of wolves. Early in 1839, Halliwell had entered a friendly correspondence with Sir Thomas Phillips, who we met earlier. Phillips was a famously obsessive 19th century antiquarian and book collector. Halliwell visited him in his home, Middle Hill, in Worcestershire, which had one of Britain's largest private libraries of ancient manuscripts. There he met and instantly began courting Phillips's eldest daughter and sole heir, Henrietta, quickly proposing marriage. Phillips forbade the union, and so the couple eloped. 
Sir Thomas never spoke to his daughter again, and he developed an intense hatred for Halliwell. The basis of this animosity was the probable and founded belief that Halliwell had stolen Phillips's early portfolio of Shakespeare's Hamlet. Over the next 20 years, a series of letters, both personal and published in the press, were exchanged between the two men. In February 1845, things came to a head. Halliwell was suddenly summoned to London to answer questions of book theft. A shelf check had been made at Trinity College, Cambridge, at some time before 1838, and 17 items were found to be missing. This coincided with the period when Halliwell had, for a few months, been among those enjoying access to the locked-up presses, and coincidentally, Halliwell had copies of the missing books in his own collection. An investigation was begun, and pending its results, Halliwell was required to relinquish his privileges as a reader at the British Museum. He strenuously denied knowledge of the theft and asserted he'd bought the items from a Soho bookseller, but couldn't provide a receipt, and, some might say very conveniently, the bookseller had since died. Letters to the press followed, and the London Times seized on the opportunity to use the scandal and the condemnation of Halliwell by the establishment to criticise an already beleaguered Prime Minister, Sir Robert Peel. Peel was a long-standing trustee of the British Museum. Under political pressure, the case was dropped, and Halliwell's museum privileges were restored. Halliwell himself never discussed the episode in later life. There does appear to be fairly strong evidence that even if Halliwell was not guilty of this crime, he most certainly was not averse to acquiring manuscripts without going through the ignominy of having to pay for them. According to an acquaintance, Halliwell believed that if he saw anything in someone else's house or a museum that he thought he was more worthy to possess, he had no scruples about taking it. He was also most certainly guilty of cutting up manuscripts, keeping the parts that were relevant to his research and discarding the rest. During his life, he's thought to have destroyed perhaps 800 books and made 3,500 scraps from these sources. A visitor to his home wrote of seeing a waste paper bin 12 feet long and 3 feet wide, nearly full of fragments. To be fair, in the time before assiduous bookkeeping and computers, cutting up manuscripts was relatively common. Certainly those who compiled the Oxford English Dictionary did the same. By 1848, Halliwell began focusing his time on Shakespeare. His life of William Shakespeare included many particulars of the poet's life, never before published. He was responsible for a major new discovery, the earliest documented record of Shakespeare being a player or an actor. He was also instrumental in the preservation and archaeological excavation of the site of New Place, Shakespeare's final home in Stratford. Although I've referred to him throughout as Halliwell, he was in fact Halliwell Phillips, which might seem odd given the enmity between him and his father-in-law Sir Thomas. The reason for this name change was that the will of his wife's grandfather left her a large inheritance on the stipulation that she and her husband took the name Phillips. In a final act of spite, Sir William had allowed Middle Hill to fall into virtual ruin and moved the legendary library to Thurlston House in Cheltenham. He stipulated in his will that neither James Orchard Halliwell or his wife, and for good measure any Roman Catholics, should ever step foot in the library. Halliwell, in comparison, was generous with his own book collection, however it was acquired. He donated manuscripts to the Smithsonian Institute, the Town Library in Penzance, and Edinburgh University. His other gifts included over 3,000 broadside ballads and poems to Chetham Library in Manchester, the oldest public reference library in the English-speaking world. In 1874, his wife Henrietta died, and James moved to Brighton. He remarried and delighted in being seen, and I quote, as a retired old lunatic. He died aged 68 in 1889. Well, I hope you enjoyed this slightly different video. If you did, please do leave a like or consider subscribing. And if you'd like to know more about the history of nursery rhymes, write in the comment section below. Bye for now.